Hello, everybody. Welcome to Mission Cures webinar on new therapies for pancreatitis. I'm really excited because we have over 300 people registered for this webinar. Um, I'm Megan Golden, co-founder and CEO of Mission Cure, and I'm here with my colleagues, Sophia Garcia, who you'll hear from later, and Lola Rahib, who's our new vice president for translational science. Um, just by way of introduction, Lola has a PhD in biomedical engineering, expertise in pancreatic cancer, and experience in both the biotech and the nonprofit sectors. And you'll get to hear more from Lola at an upcoming webinar. Uh, but suffice it to say that we're really excited to have her as part of the Mission Cure team. A uh, few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, please note the webinar is being recorded and also live streamed on Facebook and YouTube. Um, and it will be posted on Mission Cure's website tomorrow. Live captioning is available if that's helpful to you. Uh, you can click on the live transcript at the bottom of your screen. And I just learned something pretty cool that if you don't like where the captions are showing up, if they're in the way of the slides, you could just grab them with your cursor and move them wherever you want. And also these are auto-generated live captions, so I can't guarantee 100% accuracy, uh, but they should be helpful. Um, and you've joined in listen-only mode, meaning we can't hear you, but we do want your questions and please put those in the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, so I co-founded the nonprofit Mission Cure with my brother, Eric. Next slide, please. Um, in 2017, after Eric was diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis, and we were soon joined by Linda Martin, who you'll hear from in a minute, um, whose daughter, Amy, you can see here, was also suffering from chronic pancreatitis. So at Mission Cure, we collaborate with researchers and drug developers internationally to advance our understanding of what's causing and contributing to pancreatitis, to identify uh, existing drugs that can be potentially repurposed to treat the disease, and also to develop new therapeutics to help uh, pancreatitis patients. We've made a lot of progress in the four years that we've been around, um, and we'll share that at a future webinar. Uh, but a subset of the therapy development projects that Mission Cure is working to advance is funded by impact investors. We really believe that impact investors or people that want their money to produce good in society uh, or good for society in addition to a financial return can provide an important source of funding for cures for pancreatitis and other underfunded diseases. And we're always looking for interested impact investors. Uh, Mission Cure Capital is a separate company uh, from Mission Cure, the nonprofit, that invests in pancreatitis therapies. So I'm really excited for this webinar to introduce my fantastic colleague, Linda Martin, to tell you more about it. Linda? Thanks, Megan, and hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. I always look forward to our webinars, and this one is it's really especially exciting for me. I'm fired up because today we're talking about milestones and momentum in new therapies for pancreatitis. And I can't imagine a more exciting topic. And um, by the looks of the number of people who have registered, I think you all agree with me that this is a great topic. As Megan said, I joined Mission Cure while I was searching for help for my daughter, Amy, who had been finally diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis after years more than a decade of misdiagnosis. And uh, we certainly soon learned, of course, that there were no treatments. Um, but four years ago, when I joined Mission Cure, I wouldn't have imagined that in such a short time, we would have so much progress and so much advancement to tell you about, but here we are today. And I know after you listen to our speakers, our guests today, you are going to be as excited as I am. Um, many of you know me previously as Mission Cures co-director with Megan and now board chair, but I also wear another hat. I'm the co-founder and president of Mission Cure Capital, an impact investing company that has one purpose, to identify and invest in promising therapies that will improve the lives of people with recurrent acute and chronic pancreatitis or its symptoms or complications. Mission Cure Capital or MCC for short, 
invest in opportunities that meet the following three criteria. First of all, and most importantly, that it impacts uh, or has the potential to highly impact patient lives. Secondly, advances the field with new innovative science or technology. And thirdly, has a strong potential for financial returns. We were very fortunate when we started Mission Care Capital to meet Frank Kuypers, a Dutch businessman who also has chronic pancreatitis. Frank generously agreed to provide seed money and a 10-year commitment. And along with a few other investors, in January 2019, MCC was launched and we made our first investment later that year. We've invested almost a million dollars to date in five separate opportunities, each one bringing hope and promise for patients as well as for our investors. And we're looking at several, several other exciting opportunities right now. Um, and as Megan mentioned, um, let us know if you want more information about impact investing or mission care capital. But today, I'm thrilled to introduce you to three innovative and passionate biotech leaders working on new therapies to improve the lives of people with pancreatitis. With me are John Melnick, founder and CEO of Path Bioanalytics, or PBA for short, uh, Tony Colton, business founder and CEA, CEO of Regenerative Medical Solutions, or RMS for short, and Dina Cohen, um, chief scientific officer of RMS. John, Tony, Dina, thank you so much for being here today and joining us. I know our audience is really anxiously waiting to hear about the work your companies are doing to develop new therapies. So let's get started. John, let me start with you. After getting your PhD at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, you founded PBA to focus on precision medicine approaches for complex diseases. And now, one of those complex diseases is pancreatitis. Can you give us just a quick overview of PBA and explain what you mean by precision medicine approaches? Sure. Uh, hi, Linda. Um, first of all, thanks for inviting me to, to join this discussion. I, I really appreciate it. And of course, you, you bring up a, a good question. What is precision medicine? And I'm, I'm sure different people have different definitions, but for us, it's about really realizing that a one size fits all approach isn't always the best approach to, to medicine or the development of new drugs. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean every person who happens to be sick needs uh, a drug specifically tailored to them. But we do think that drug development should be approached in a more, I would say, nuanced way uh, than it has in the past. And I guess to go back to the first part of your question, uh, you mentioned I, I started PBA in 2014, and we research, and we test, and we develop drugs. But in, instead of having a, a traditional mindset and targeting a uh, broad disease like asthma, for example, we have what we like to think of as a precision medicine mindset. And so we would say in the case of asthma, okay, some people have asthma as a result of allergies. Some have it as a result of infections. And sometimes it's caused by dust. And you know, instead of treating all of those different types of asthma as the same, why don't we focus on one and develop a drug specifically for that group. And the, the reason that we, we do this is because drug development is already an incredibly complex uh, process. And so by focusing in on a, a subset of a disease, it helps reduce that complexity, making the problem just a little bit easier and hopefully increase our overall chance of success. That's very interesting. Um, in 2019, Megan and I read that PBA had licensed a compound and was working on developing it for people who have cystic fibrosis. You just gave us an example of thinking of asthma as different subtypes, uh, allergies, for example, versus dust versus chemicals. How are you breaking cystic fibrosis down into similar kinds of subtypes? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And I guess, first of all, as, as background, um, we know that the genes in our body provide the instructions for our cells to make proteins. And proteins are, are really important for the basic 
functions of, of our bodies. But sometimes a gene has a mutation that causes our body to make a, you know, a slightly different version of a protein, which might not function as well. And that's what happens in the case of, of, of cystic fibrosis. Uh, mutations in, in one particular gene called the CFTR gene result in a protein, uh, hopefully called the CFTR protein, that, that just can't do its job as well. And that job uh, is to move molecules uh, in and out of our cells. It turns out is, is really important. And it's a job that happens throughout the entire body. So you, you can imagine when this, this protein, it, it doesn't function right, it messes up a lot of different things. And that means that the symptoms of cystic fibrosis are, are pretty broad and include anything from chronic coughing, heartburn, infertility, and even abdominal, abdominal pain. Um, now, I mentioned before that mutations in one gene, the CFTR gene, cause uh, CF, but it turns out that there are hundreds of different types of mutations that can happen in this one gene that all lead to cystic fibrosis. And so I guess going back to your, your question about how we were thinking about different types of CF, we were thinking about it in terms of the different types of mutations in the CFTR gene. Some mutations were similar, others were different. And that's how we, we wanted to break down this complex disease in, into simpler components. Wow, um, that's really, it's, it's so fascinating because um, when cystic fibrosis researchers were starting to gain much more detailed understanding of the different types of CFTR mutations that you just mentioned and their role in cystic fibrosis, the pancreatitis field was just starting to realize the role that CFTR gene plays in pancreatitis. Absolutely. And in fact, at this point, changes in the CFTR protein uh, are now linked to, to several different diseases, not just CF and pancreatitis. Yeah, really, really interesting. Uh, I remember that uh, Megan and I visited you at your lab in North Carolina, and you showed us some of your team's research, which was very cool because you were using a lot of these things called organoids and maybe um, help us understand a little bit about what exactly is an organoid. Yeah, well, as you mentioned, we, we grow organoids uh, from human cells and you can think of an organoid almost as a mini organ. It's basically a little ball of cells and it does a really good job replicating a lot of the a lot of the biological complexity that, that we find in the body. And we use these to study different biological processes, how those work in healthy people and, and how they might go wrong when somebody has a disease. Now, uh, our organoids are, are special because they have this protein that we've been talking about, the, the CFTR protein. So, you know, let, let's say, Linda, you have a slightly different different CFTR protein because you have a mutation in your CFTR gene, we can take a sample of your cells and use them to grow organoids. And then those organoids don't just have anyone's version of the CFTR protein, they have your specific version of it. So in other words, the, the organoids are sort of personalized to, to you because we use your cells to grow them. And once we, we grow those organoids, we can see how they behave and importantly, how they respond. And then by extension, how uh, you might respond when we treat them with different drugs designed to improve the, the function of, of that protein. So, you know, we, we did this for cystic fibrosis. We grew organoids from people who had lots of different CFTR mutations and tested different drugs to see which ones work best and what types of CFTR mutations they work best on. And then when you and Megan reached out, you, you basically said, look, you're, you're doing all this work for people with cystic fibrosis, growing organoids, testing drugs. Uh, we think some people with pancreatitis have the disease because of CFTR. Could you grow organoids from these people and, and look for drugs that could help them? And this was a really interesting request because 
I have to admit, before you mentioned it, we really were not aware of the link between CFTR and pancreatitis. You, you really opened our eyes to that. Um, it also, I, looking back, it also seemed like a great opportunity because there had already been so much time, money, and effort invested in developing drugs for CF that improved CFTR function. It would be great if we could piggyback off that progress and replicate that work in pancreatitis and, and do that work faster and more efficiently. Exactly. And it was so exciting to learn about that, um, not only for the community at large, but both Megan's brother and my daughter had CFTR mutation. So we had a personal interest in advancing that work. So we put a research project together and you dove right in. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, since we grow organoids from cells, Step number one was to collect cells from, from volunteers. And you and, and the Mission Cure team really helped us with this, finding people who had both pancreatitis and a CFTR mutation and, and wanted to help our... And this you know, did take several months and was slowed down a bit by, by COVID, but we eventually got enough cells to start step number two, which was growing organoids. And so I think we have a little animation here of, of organoids and what these things actually look like. So here, what we see are organoids from an individual with a fully functioning CFTR protein. And what we're doing is, is activating that protein and as I mentioned, molecules start moving around and fluid is actually going into these organoids and causing them to swell and to increase in size. And we can also grow organoids, of course, from people who have pancreatitis. And when we do that and we activate the CFTR protein, you know, it doesn't work as well. And so we don't see that robust change in size that we saw before. It really just sort of stays about the same size. But then, of course, if we are able to treat these organoids with a highly effective uh, therapeutic, we restore the function of that protein and we restore this response, this uh, ability to move ions back and forth. And we see that very vividly here by this organoid changing in size. Really very fascinating. Um, let me see if I've got this right. I'm not a scientist, but let's see if I can summarize. Um, first, your team collected 50 samples from patients with pancreatitis and also from people who didn't have pancreatitis. Um, you created a biobank and then you used those samples to grow organized similar to what we, you've just shown us here. And then you tested many different drugs and drug combinations on those organoids to find out if any might cause a chain change in the organoid, which would be a signal that you might've found a compound that could impact CFTR driven pancreatitis. Does that sound about right? Yeah, that, that sounds about right. And, and after all of that, it turns out that some of the compounds that we tested uh, did in fact seem to work in, in our organoids. And so now the, the next step is to take our, our best performer, our best candidate, and see if it works in actual people in, in a clinical trial. And so that is what we are working on right now. Uh, conducting a clinical trial, of course, is a lot of work though, but we happen to have a head start because the compound that so far has performed the best isn't a completely new compound. It's been around for, for several years and it was originally developed for a completely different disease. So we already know a lot about it. We know it's safe to use, we know how to make it, uh, so on and so forth. And you know, all of this saves us time and ultimately gets us to our goal more quickly, which is, really to have a safe and effective medication for people who can really benefit from it. So it sounds like there's a, still a lot of work to be done, but you've got a pretty good head start on what can be a long and expensive process. We always hear about how it costs billions of dollars uh, to develop a drug and run clinical trials. 
Of course, MCC doesn't have billions of dollars. Well, at least not yet. Um, so was the funding that MCC provided an important thing for PBA? A absolutely. I mean, on a practical side, PBA is and uh, has always been a small company. So we just didn't have the resources to all of a sudden start a new research program for, for a new disease. And you, you're you right, drug development is a long and expensive process, but it's also, I would say an incremental process. And, and I say that as a good thing. You know, you, you might do a small research study that leads to some insight, and that leads to a hypothesis on, on how to treat a disease. And that in turn leads to a, a larger research study to confirm that hypothesis. And then you, you know, develop a drug and, and test it in clinical studies. And if you don't have that, that initial research, you never get to those great insights. You never get to those clinical trials or those new medicines. So it is incredibly important to have groups like MCC who are willing to support these promising but early stage projects. Uh, but you know, with that said, not only have you provided funding though, uh, but also helped educate us on, on pancreatitis. You've shared research and, and, and allowed us to talk to, to people who have it uh, about their experiences with the disease. And you've also introduced us you know, to leading experts in the field, helped us brainstorm uh, on strategy and, and funding options, and, and just generally supported our work. And it has been a collaborative partnership uh, throughout the entire time. Thank you, John. Uh, you and your team at PBA are doing such important work around CFTR and CFTR-driven pancreatitis. I see questions coming into the chat. Um, there's a lot of interest and we'll get to those in just a bit. Just uh, one comment uh, for our audience. Um, the process that John's been describing here, using organoids and screening for potential therapeutics, um, not only can be, but is being applied to other kinds of um, genetically driven pancreatitis, such as PRSS1 and others. So, and Mission Cure is working with groups to advance those. So I don't want you to think that um, all sizes fit one. As John said, that's clearly not the case with pancreatitis and we are always looking for many shots on goal. So we'll stay tuned for, for additional uh, advancements in the future. Um, but next I'm thrilled to introduce Tony Colton, business founder, and CEO of Regenerative Medical Solutions, or RMS, and RMS's Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Dina Cohen, who joins us from Madison, Wisconsin. Tony has an impressive track record in startups and technology companies and earned advanced accounting and law degrees from DePaul University. And as C CSO, Dina is responsible for the direction of RMS's research program and oversees the research team and leads both product and process development for the company. She received her BS degree in biology from MIT and a PhD in genetics from Harvard. So with this impressive team, RMS is committed to curing diabetes of all types, including type 3C, the lesser known type, but that we know on this call is caused by pancreatic disease like chronic pancreatitis or pancreatic surgery. Tony and Dina, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Tony, in a few minutes, I'm gonna ask you a little bit about RMS, the company, and why you joined as an investor and CEO. But before we get to that, RMS has a very innovative approach for curing diabetes, but it can seem very complicated to those of us who are not scientists. Dina, can you explain the solution RMS is working on and how it will be delivered to patients? Sure, Linda, I'd be happy to. First, thanks so much for inviting me and Tony to participate in this exciting session. And we're really glad to hear about all the great work John's doing at his company. Um, now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about a complication of pancreatitis, which is diabetes, um, which is the focus of RMS. So RMS is dedicated to making a cell-based therapy for diabetes. I thought before we dive into the therapy itself, maybe be helpful to do a quick reminder of sort of what diabetes is and what causes it. So diabetes is, in essence is a disease in which patients can no longer make enough of their own insulin to control their blood sugar. So insulin is a hormone 
and it's normally made by one special type of cell in the body called a beta cell. And that beta cell is found in a little, um, little structures through, that are located in the pancreas called the pancreatic islets or the islets of Langerhans. Um, and right now we do not have a cure for diabetes, but instead patients with diabetes have to work closely with their care teams in order to manage their blood sugar using things like glucose monitors, insulin injections, or insulin pumps. But unfortunately, um, even with these newest technologies, um, we, patients are not able to achieve as good blood sugar control as they do when the insulin is being produced by beta cells. And so even with all the, all the new medications and technologies, some patients still really struggle to control their blood sugar. Yeah, I know diabetes can be very difficult to manage, uh, especially for people with type 3C diabetes. Again, I have personal experience with my daughter with that. Um, Dana, if beta cells are so much better at controlling blood sugar than insulin injections, why aren't more patients having a pancreas transplant? That's a great question. So sometimes diabetic patients do in fact receive a, a transplant of either an entire pancreas or just the pancreatic fluids that would be received from an organ donor. But unfortunately, there are a lot of barriers to, um, for patients to receive this kind of treatment. Um, first of all, a pancreas transplant is a major surgery. Not everybody uh, is a suitable candidate for that kind of operation. And then also, I'm sure as, as you guys all know, donated organs are really scarce and have really long waiting lists. So there's just not enough transplantable material for everyone who needs it. <clears throat> and then finally, um, if you re receive a don an organ donation, uh, you have to take immunosuppression medications for the rest of your life. Um, and those medications um, have some major risks and side effects. So all in all, at the moment, very few patients, diabetic patients are treated with transplants right now. Um, as you know, in the case of chronic pancreatitis, there's another option, which is called total pancreatectomy with islet autotransplant, or TPIAT. And in that case, um, the person's own pancreas is removed to treat their chronic pancreatitis. But um, the, during the surgical procedure, those, the islets in that person's pancreas, which contain the beta cells that make insulin, can be removed and then returned to the person's body um, so that the, that person would not become diabetic after surgery. So the idea sounds really simple, but of course, in practice, it's a lot more complicated. So um, sometimes it's not possible to restore enough islets to the patient to prevent diabetes or sometimes even, even if diabetes is prevented initially, um, at some point after the operation, those islets can stop functioning so that the patient would eventually become diabetic and require insulin treatment. Okay, so it sounds like even though replacing the beta cells is a very promising treatment for diabetes, and I know one that you know, others are looking at, uh, at the moment, it's not really widely available. Um, can you tell me how RMS is planning to address this problem or these problems? Sure. So RMS has developed a new way to make replacement beta cells based on stem cell technology. So the basic idea is that every single cell in your body contains the same set of instructions that are encoded in your DNA. So that means, for example, that a cell in your blood contains all the instructions that it needs to be a beta cell, even though it's not at that moment using those, that particular set of instructions. So what RMS does to make new beta cells has two steps. First, we start with a blood cell and we use a process called reprogramming to essentially wipe the cell's memory clean. We make it forget that it was ever a blood cell and we return it to a more primitive embryo-like state that's kind of like a blank slate where the cell now has the potential to become any cell type in the body because it still has all those instructions that it needs um, inside it. And so this sort of blank state cell is called an induced pluripotent stem cell. And the nice thing about these is we can make basically an unlimited number of these cells from any patient. So the next thing we do is we start with that induced pluripotent stem cell that has the potential to become any type of cell in the body. And we expose it to a series of steps where we treat the cells with different signals. With, and those signals instruct the cell to become an insulin producing beta cell. And then those new beta cells that, that we make at the end of that process could be transplanted back into the patient. Um, and we think there are a couple of big advantages to this approach. So the first thing that's important is we can make as many beta cells as we need whenever we need them. 
Um, so we don't need to uh, anymore to rely on isolating islets either from a patient themselves or from an organ donor. And then the second big advantage is because the new beta cells that we're making are derived from the patient's own cells, um, the idea is that when those are transplanted, the body will accept them as its own tissue and the patient won't need to be immunosuppressed. Their body will just take on, take on that tissue um, without, it, without it projecting it. So we think this type of therapy is especially well suited to treat patients with chronic pancreatitis who've become diabetic. So um, it could be used um, either before or after a pancreatectomy. So in, in the future, we would envision a sort of treatment paradigm where um, we could engage with patients prior to their pancreatectomy surgery and prepare the cells for them ahead of time. So that patient could go into their pancreatectomy surgery knowing with confidence that they would have enough replacement beta cells available to them after the surgery to avoid becoming diabetic. And another nice feature of the technology is that um, stem, that once the stem cells are made, we can just keep them in the freezer. So if the patient, um, for example, needed a new dose of cells later on to help continuing to manage their diabetes, we could prepare it for them without having to repeat that reprogramming step at the beginning. Wow, that is very cool. Um, I'm so excited about the work that you're doing. Uh, I'm personally excited for our community, but also for my own daughter who did not have a successful islet transplant when she had TPIAT and is now fully insulin dependent. Um, as you mentioned, RMS's therapy could be life-changing for people with all types of diabetes, including type 3C diabetes, which is of course near and dear to many of the people on this call today. But it's unusual that a rare condition like type 3C gets a treatment before the larger population. So why is RMS starting with type 3C? Yeah, so we wanted to start with type 3C because um, in some ways, so from a biology perspective, it's a very simple form of diabetes compared with the other types of diabetes. Because in the case of type 3C diabetes, the pancreas is really the only organ involved. So type one diabetes um, is an autoimmune disease where the body, act, the immune system actually attacks and destroys its own beta cells. So if we, if we were to be targeting type one diabetes, we would have to worry about whether the immune system um, would attack and destroy our uh, transplanted cells as well. And type two diabetes is of course the most common kind of diabetes in the world right now, but it um, is more complicated to, to work with because patients who have type two diabetes very often have other conditions at the same time, like high blood pressure or heart disease. So studying new therapies in those patients can, can be made very difficult um, by those other comorbidities. So we feel like the type, type three C patients are a, a great fit for us because there's a, they have a huge need for this kind of therapy. And there's, so it's an opportunity for RMS to really directly impact uh, a lot of patients' lives. Um, and we also think that the lessons that we learn by developing this therapy for type 3C diabetes will be really directly applicable to patients with other types of type diabetes like type 1 and type 2. So it's really a win-win for us. Thank you, Dina. Tony, you must be very proud of the work that's going on at RMS. Um, there are a lot of companies working on various kinds of diabetes treatments. And I know you're an experienced biotech investor. So I wanna ask you just a few questions to help uh, our audience know a little bit more about RMS and find out why you're so excited about uh, being there as an investor and CEO. So maybe we could just start and you could tell us a little bit about who is John Adarico, who co-founded and is the medical and scientific founder of RMS and what is, you know, what is his background and what is unique about him leading a biotech like RMS? Tony, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you uh, so much, Linda. And thank you so much for your investment in RMS. I used to be in uh, venture capital. Um, working for a conglomerate in downtown Chicago uh, called Northwest Industries in uh, the 1980s. And uh, I uh, was in charge of biotech in particular and attended um, um, seminars and 
Madison, Wisconsin, eventually moved to the city and um, then moved back to Chicago to start a software company, which I ran for 20 plus years. But my first love was always biotech. And um, it was just luck that I came across Dr. Odorico because he moved next door to my best friend in Madison, Wisconsin in 1995. And my buddy, uh, Gary, told me about this genius doctor that was working on something new called stem cells. As it turns out, Dr. Odorico had the good fortune of meeting Dr. Jamie Thompson, who is credited as the father of stem cells. And Dr. Odorico uh, did his uh, early lab work and actually worked under the hood, uh, culturing stem cells. So I've been following Dr. Odorico since 1995 and was following his tremendous progress, receiving uh, patents and uh, funding from uh, various uh, uh, non uh, public uh, companies such as uh, JDRF and even the Pentagon. And then in uh, 2010, when I sold my software company, my uh, first thing was to call my buddy Gary, set up a meeting with Dr. Odorico. I funded the company initially, and that was over uh, 10 years ago. And since then, we've made tremendous, tremendous progress. We uh, set, uh, spun out uh, the company into uh, uh, a lab in the incubator in Madison. And, um, we uh, have uh, come up with a, a way to culture cells so that they're beta producing and highly therapeutic and we've cured mice and uh, we have to cure another batch of mice and then um, we'll file an ID, IND and inject humans in a phase one trial. That's awesome. Um, it's my understanding that both you and Dr. Adarico have some personal interest in diabetes. It's not just a business venture for either of you. Can you tell us about that? Well, the very first day I met Dr. Odorico, I, I learned that he was working on this um, for his daughter who has type 1 diabetes. And uh, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, he started in 1995. Um, and from the very beginning, his mission was to create beta cells to cure humans of type 1 diabetes. And he wasn't even married. He gets married in 2000. 2003, he had a daughter. In 2006, she was <laughs> diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So he is really, really devoted. And actually, that's my main reason for investing in the company and starting the company, because I knew I had someone that was very passionate and very, very smart um, to lead the uh, scientific uh, endeavor. And also, it didn't hurt that I have type 2 diabetes and I want to cure myself. And my sister has type 1 diabetes and she takes three shots a day and calls me every day and says, when you're going to have a cure for me. So we're all, we're pretty committed. <laughs> well, you guys are making, uh, all, of, all of your team are making great progress. And I think added to the personal connection, as it says here on the slide, Dr. Odorico also has years and years of experience in um, pancreas transplant, islet cell, TPIAT. Um, and so he's very familiar and has worked with a lot of the patients that we're talking about here that stand to benefit from the new innovation and, and progress you're making. Um, I see that we have uh, questions coming into the Q&A and it's time to transition to that, but I'm gonna just um, stay on the mic for a second and ask um, you, Tony, uh, first, and then John, you. Um, you've both talked about development and moving and getting to clinical trials. And uh, again, we all know it's a long process. So Tony, maybe you can start by talking a little bit about sort of the timing and timeline that um, our audience might 
expect with the, the work you're doing to get to a clinical trial? Thank you. Um, we, we are hoping to get fast tracked and we should be fast tracked by law uh, to get FDA approval to uh, inject humans. And that's because, and that's another reason why we uh, selected C3 to begin with, because um, it's uh, designated as an orphan drug designation. And the FDA for orphan drug designations is supposed to, to accelerate things and fast track things. So we have an IND file uh, to, to cure uh, pancreatitis patients. I mean, we have it ready to go. Uh, however, we just, um, went to a new formulation that like doubles the therapeutic power of our cells and um, is much, much more pure. We call it formula six. So we've gone through hundreds of versions of, the, of this over the last uh, dozen years and uh, we're locking that in. We, we think we're finally there and, and by March 31st, we'll have this formula locked. Now, every time you change your culture formula to create beta cells, the FDA requires a mouse study. So we intend to start that uh, uh, mouse study in, in, in the second uh, quarter of this year. It's a six-month study. So around the end of the year, we'll have results, maybe take a couple more months to uh, reap the organs and, of the mice and analyze them and and get all the data we need to submit to the FDA. That's the only thing we don't have filled out in this IND to get approval. And then, you know, maybe it takes another year. I don't know, hopefully not, for the FDA to uh, give us approval. So uh, I, I'm, you know, guessing maybe worst case, uh, by the end of next year, we'll be injecting humans. That, that's if all goes well, but. As yeah. you know, there's Murphy's Law and well, uh, we, you know, we'll, all kinds of yeah. things can go wrong. <laughs> of course, we'll, we'll, be, we'll stay optimistic that things go smoothly. Uh, John, maybe you can also take a stab at, uh, at that question. When do you think uh, you'll, you'll get to a clinical trial stage? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a legitimate question and a, a difficult one because there are so many variables involved. Uh, one being just conversations with the FDA and, and whether or not they will uh, fast track something like this. Um, but as I mentioned before, I, I think we're in a really promising position by virtue of the fact that this is not a brand new uh, chemical compound that we're developing. We already have a, a lot of, of uh, data in hand. We, we know how the drug behaves, how it performs, how to make it. So that has that's probably shaved you know 18 to, to 24 months off of off of our, our timeline. Uh, so we're really excited about that. Um, and with that said, you know, we, we could expect to start a, a clinical study sometime in the next, I think, 10 to, to 18 months, uh, depending on how, how things go. But when we do, uh, we will definitely be advertising and, and and getting the word out through the through the mission cure network so that that will be the place to look thank you and and thank you john dina tony um this is all really exciting and the timelines are actually quite you know not that far out so we're, we're really super excited um i know we have other questions so i'm going to turn the mic over now to um sophia who will uh, take your questions and move us on here. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. And thanks all of you for all of your wonderful questions. Um, some of them have already been answered, like the cl clinical trial questions. Uh, but here's one question for you, John. You've mentioned um, how you take organoids and target the CFTR protein. Does this, would this process work for any other type of pancreatitis, like PRSS1 pancreatitis? Uh, and kind of what is the scope in that, um, in that sphere? Yeah, the, the, the good news is in these organoids, there's a lot of biology happening. 
and there are a lot of other proteins present. And so the, the, the basic idea of, of using organoids to investigate drugs for some of these other types of pancreatitis is very uh, viable. And I believe the Mission Cure group is, is working with several other leading researchers uh, to pursue some of the other subtypes of, of pancreatitis as well. Thank you. Um, and here's the question for you, Dina. Uh, when you're talking about these islet cells, how long do these function in the body? That's a great question. And the, the short answer is we don't know yet um, because as, as Tony mentioned, we've so far we've only been able to study their function in mice and uh, mice don't live as long as people do. So we know that they can, they can control diabetes in mice for, for many months but uh, it won't really be until we put these cells into humans that we'll have a sense of how long they can really work to, to cure a person. We're, ho we're, we're hoping for, based on, based on what you can get with organ donor islets, we're hoping for at least several years, but some people who receive donor islets can be insulin independent for a decade or more. Also, let me add that you know, we're gonna, store the patient's blood and, and, and freeze it in, in case we, we uh, need to do a, a, another a dose, but um, we won't know until we, uh, we try in humans. We'll be optimistic and hopefully um, we'll be looking at the results of, of that when we are able to test in humans. Um, another question for you, John, once, you, since you're developing this drug that targets the CFTR protein, what exactly is the mechanism that changes in the person's body? So what happens to their protein or to their CFTR protein? Yeah, well, the, the protein uh, simply does a, a more efficient job at moving these ions in and out of the cell. And what we've seen in our work and, and the work of others is that really helps reduce the inflammation uh, in, in the pancreas. Um, so I would, I would say that's the, the primary you know, uh, target of, of these compounds. And this is a very interesting question um, and I'll, I'll leave it open to see if you, John or, or Tony can answer it, but how much, this is obviously both of you guys are based in the US, uh, and we have an international audience. We have people from all over the world, but we also have a lot of people in the UK. Um, how much of this information can be shared or is shared with companies or agencies in the UK or, or Europe? Well, um, just at a, at a basic level, um, PBA has collaborations uh, going on and, and in the works with companies in, in North America as, as well as South America. And we're collaborating with them because perhaps they have some aspect, some new technology that will help us work more efficiently or, or vice versa. And so we're, we're definitely thinking about working towards a solution on a, on a global basis. We're, we're not limiting ourselves to you know, collaborations in the US or, or only helping patients in the US. We're concentrated right now in the US, but I'm sure that uh, once the news gets out and we uh, cure some patients here, uh, it'll be worldwide. Actually, we've had some big pharma companies uh, look over our shoulder and we've met with them and uh, they'll take over. I guarantee you <laughs> there'll be a conga line of big pharma once the press release comes out and um, they'll take the ball and run with it. They actually one big pharma company already uh, has designs on a worldwide marketing effort to bring our product uh, to cure tens of millions of diabetics worldwide. And uh, they're just waiting uh, for the uh, proof and the with the mouse study. And uh, um, when this works, uh, they're gonna grab it, I'm sure. And, take it worldwide and that's okay. I mean, <laughs> we'll get the Nobel Prize, but you know, they can cure everybody in the world. We just can't do it. We're a small company. So 
uh, most definitely we're going to partner up with uh, one of these big pharma companies. And so far, they really like what they see. They really do. And we're in constant contact with them. And they're monitoring all our studies, our in vitro studies, our mouse studies, and boom, as soon as we got the proof, they're going to grab it and run with it. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure patients uh, all over the world are very eager to, um, to see finally a cure for, for diabetes and also pancreatitis. Um, one more question for you, John, uh, sort of a clarification for what you were just talking about. So this treatment, does it prevent further damage to the pancreas or does it heal the damage that has already been done? Uh, can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, that, that's, that's a great question. And of course, it's a little hard to tell right now because we, we haven't yet done uh, those types of clinical studies. But, but what I, I can relay is what we have seen in the cystic fibrosis space, because people who are born with cystic fibrosis have, have very damaged uh, uh, pancreases. And when they take similar medications that also target the same protein, uh, there have been some, some pretty uh, unexpected, I would say, improvements in pancreatic function. So th that was very encouraging to see that research and has given us a lot of uh, confidence that we're pursuing a, a worthwhile approach to this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do see the um, remaining questions. Uh, some of them are quite specific to uh, your, your own situation. So I do encourage you all, I'm going to pull up um, our contact information. And I do encourage all of you who have further questions or want to get in contact with us to um, do so through our email. Um, and I will also in just a bit pull up the, um, the contact information for both RMS and Path Bioanalytics. Um, and that in short, concludes our Q&A session. Thank you all so much for all of your wonderful questions. And thank you for joining us on our first webinar of the year. Uh, I just want to take a quick second to give a very special thank you to John, Dina, and Tony for sharing their expertise with us. Um, as we all know, pancreatitis patients have been waiting for a cure and for effective therapies for decades. And it's just so exciting to see changes being made in real time, just right before our eyes. Uh, and I'm sure everyone here is just as excited to see that Pathway Analytics and RMS are working tirelessly to, me to meet all the needs of pancreatitis patients. So thank you all for all of your work and for joining us today and for answering the questions of um, patients and advocates that came to watch this webinar. Uh, and just as a closing, I will also pull up the contact information just um, so that the audience gets to see it. Um, but we have many other informative and educational resources coming down the pipeline as part of our AbbVie sponsor, sponsored patient education program. Uh, we're having a webinar on nutrition for chronic pancreatitis. This has been a very widely suggested uh, webinar topic. So we're very excited to finally bring that to you all. Uh, we also have an update on our cure strategy featuring our new VP of translational science, Lola Rahib, whom you uh, heard of a little bit earlier today. And we also have a guided video meditation for pancreatitis pain, which is going to be really exciting to put out. So a lot of great content coming out. Uh, so please stay in contact with us via social media or our website or our newsletter. Um, We'd also like you to please fill out the survey after you leave the webinar. It'll automatically pop up on your browser. It should only take you about a minute to complete and it's completely anonymous. So please be as candid as you'd like. Uh, we try to bring you all the best content that we can and we always strive to make it um, as patient friendly as possible. So please leave us your feedback, we welcome it. Um, and as far as logistics go, Megan mentioned this a little bit earlier, but you'll be receiving an email in 24 hours with a recording of this webinar. 
And you'll also have access to the slides. So in case you want to refer back to any of the wonderful information that John, Dina, and Tony um, mentioned, as well as uh, the information from Mission Gear Capital, you'll also be able to see that. Um, and if you have any questions, our virtual door is always open for questions or comments or concerns. Um, I did notice that some of the Q&A questions, like I said before, were a little bit too uh, personal for your scenarios, or they were just a little bit outside of the scope for this particular webinar, but we're always happy to help and happy to answer questions. We have a team of wonderful scientific and medical advisors that are amazing at answering questions. Um, so please send us your, your questions and comments. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day or night, depending on where you are. Thanks everyone and goodbye. <laughs>